Hello, and thank you for joining us for the next session of the Destination IP Virtual Summit. In this session, Pamela Huff and Jessica McDonald will present 2020 Mid-Year Review, Top Trademark Rulings and Practice Updates. A recording of the webinar and the slides will be made available to all registrants. Feel free to enter any questions using the Q&A feature in the Zoom menu. Also, feel free to follow us on LinkedIn to see news about other upcoming webinars. And with that, I'll turn things over to Pamela and Jessica. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, my name is Pam Huff, um, and I'm at Schwegman, Lundberg Wessner, and again, I'm glad that you were able to join us today. I've been uh, practicing trademark law for about 30 years, uh, and you know, it's always interesting to see what's going on in the world of case law and also USBT up, USBTO updates. Jessica? Hi, everyone. My name is Jessica McDonald. I'm also an attorney at Schwigman, Lundberg, and Westner. I've been practicing as a trademark attorney for about 12 years, um, and I want to thank everybody for joining us. We're excited to share with you some of these recent case updates and USPTO practice changes. Next slide, please. Yeah, so as Jessica mentioned, we're going to be hitting on some and sharing some favorite, you know, fairly recent uh, trademark rulings also some TTAB rulings and some recent USPTO updates. Next slide, please. So we have five federal trademark rulings that we wanted to share with you today. Um, three of these have had pretty recent rulings. Um, Booking.com was in June, Romag was in April, and then Royal Crown was in August, just a few days ago, in fact. Um, and the Tiffany and Woodstock cases are both up on appeal and we'll be watching those. Next slide, please. Jessica? So I'm going to start off today's discussion with the USPTO versus Booking.com case. This was a Supreme Court case that was argued on May 4th of this year. And in sort of an interesting note, it was the first telephonic oral argument that was ever held before the Supreme Court. Um, and then the issue, the uh, opinion was issued June 30th of this year by Justice Ginsburg. Next slide, please. So to give you a little bit of background, uh, Booking.com operates a website at www.booking.com. And the website's used for making various travel reservations, uh, hotels, flights, car rentals. And here in this slide are just some of the examples of how they're using their mark that were included uh, as part of the joint appendix that was submitted to the Supreme Court. Um, the ones on the left in orange are some banner advertisements that were on some websites. The, Add on the lower right hand corner is from their Facebook page. Next slide, please. To give you a little bit of the procedural history, Booking.com back in 2012 sought to register four different marks at the USPTO, all including Booking.com. Some were stylized, one was a word mark. The USPTO, both the examiner and the TTAB, maintained a per se rule that when you add .com to a generic term, it results in a generic composite that's unprotectable. So they refused registration of Booking.com's registrations. Booking.com then appealed to the US District Court for the Eastern District of Virginia. And as part of that appeal, they were procedurally allowed to enter in some new evidence, which they did uh, regarding the consumer perception of the mark. And it was that evidence that the court really relied on in making its decision. So unlike the USPTO, which held that it was generic for online hotel reservation services and not entitled to registration, the district court found that the mark was actually descriptive of services that were available at that domain and did not name the genus of the goods and services. So they found that they had met the requirements for registration because they had also proved that the descriptive mark had acquired secondary meaning. The USPTO then appealed the decision to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals that affirmed the lower court's ruling and they found that booking.com is not generic they found there was no error in the lower court's determination of how consumers view booking.com 
and booking.com was descriptive. And as part of this decision, they rejected the USPTO's per se rule that when you combine a generic term with .com results in a generic composite. Next slide. So the case was then uh, before the Supreme Court and the issue that was before the Supreme Court was whether the addition of .com to a generic term can result in a protectable trademark. And the Supreme Court said that it could potentially. So they affirmed the Fourth Circuit decision and their holding was a term that's styled as a generic term plus .com is a generic name for a class of goods or services and thus ineligible for federal trademark protection only if the term has that meaning to consumers. So their entire decision really turns on what the mark signifies to consumers and it's really consumer perception that is key. So here in this case, because the lower court found that booking.com was perceived by consumers as being descriptive, rather than naming the genus of goods or services, they found that it was eligible for trademark registration. Next slide. So it was interesting in, in the case, um, it was presumed that booking was considered a generic term that wasn't on dispute before the Supreme Court. It also was not considered, uh, and the USPTO didn't appeal the issue of how consumers perceive the mark. So they did not evaluate any of the survey issues. They basically accepted the, the proposition that consumers view this descript uh, descriptively and that it had acquired secondary meaning. So the USPTO in their arguments argued for their per se rule, like they have held in the past for generic .com marks. The court rejected that. Uh, they said it really should be a case by case analysis. And, and really the USPTO's own past practice didn't reflect that as a rule because they had allowed other generic marks to be registered plus .com. They also rejected the USPTO's argument that this was similar to the Goodyear case, which held that adding company to a generic term uh, results in a generic composite. They said it's different for domain names because of the exclusivity of domain names. Only one party can own a domain at a particular point in time. So that was really key for them in distinguishing from that Goodyear case. The USPT also argued that there were various anti-competitive concerns about allowing parties to register generic.com marks. Again, the court rejected those arguments saying that's really a, an issue for any descriptive marks, that there's gonna be others that want to use those terms. But they found that the likelihood of confusion analysis already takes that into account and that there's already doctrines that will protect against that the courts are gonna assess the strength or weakness of the mark. They're gonna look at the scope of the mark and other marks that are out there in terms of giving um, the scope of protection to it. So they rejected those concerns from the USPTO. Booking.com on the other hand, it, they, had they had a survey that proved about 75% of consumers consider Booking.com to be a brand. Uh, they argued for the allowance of their mark because if there was a rule opposite of that, then it would lead to cancellation of all these other marks that had been registered already with, that had a generic plus.com. Um, they also argued that it was harder to protect against typo squatters, cyber squatters for their mark. So I have a quote here from the Supreme Court, and I think this sort of illustrates their decision. Um, it says, if booking.com were generic, we might expect consumers to understand Travelocity, another such service, to be a booking.com. We might similarly expect that a consumer searching for a trusted source of online hotel reservation services could ask a frequent traveler to name her favorite booking.com provider. Consumers do not, in fact, perceive the term booking.com that way, the court determined below. And therefore, they... Uh, allowed those types of marks to be registered so long as they have that meaning to consumers. So this isn't a blanket rule that any generic.com marks can be registered, just the ones that have an association as a brand to consumers. So going forward, I mean, just a, a quick note on that. The USPTO is in the process of drafting its examination guide on this case. So we'll, it'll be interesting to see what um, guidance they offer. Um, because moving forward, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, one, what scope of protection these marks are going to get, and then two, what's going to be required 
to obtain a registration because it's still going to be a relatively high burden, um, one that's likely going to require a survey. Um, so it's still going to be very expensive. I mean, a, a well-designed survey is probably going to be in the tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, you know, I expect it's really only going to be larger companies that have very well-established brands that are going to be able to achieve these types of registrations. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll see as more case law develops on this. All right, next slide. Yeah, so the, the next case is also a Supreme Court case, the Romag Fasteners versus Fossil Inc. This particular case was argued on January 14th of this year, and the opinion was actually issued in April. Uh, it has been vacated, remanding, remanded, and the opinion was issued by Justice Gorsuch. Next slide, please. So here, you know, I, I thought it would be helpful in this particular case to see what the issue was, the holding, and some background before we actually go back through kind of the, the procedural background. Um, the issue before the Supreme Court was whether willful infringement is a prerequisite to an award of profits, and that's under 15 U.S.C. Section 1117A. Um, the holding was that willfulness is, while highly important, right, and is always a highly important consideration in awarding profits, it's not an absolute precondition. Um, just some quick background. Um, so Romag and, and Fossil signed an agreement um, to use Romag's fasteners in Fossil's leather goods. You'll see a picture, this is from the case on the left-hand side, of the fastener being used in one of, or on a purse, which is one of Fossil's uh, leather goods. Um, the, the picture on the right is actually the true Romag fastener, um, as well as the counterfeit. <clears throat> I think it's difficult to see from this picture, but my understanding is that the counterfeit, one of the periods, I believe after patent, is in a slightly different place, and that's how they could tell that it was counterfeit. Um, Romag actually discovered that factories in China that were making the fossil products were using counterfeit fasteners, um, and they believed that you know, Fossil was doing little to protect against this. I think one of the big issues that I really felt when I was reading through the case law was that um, this had happened before to Fossil. This was not the first time that counterfeit goods had been used in China. And so Romag just didn't feel like Fossil was doing enough to protect against that. Um, so that was actually back in May 2010 that, uh, that Romag discovered that, you know, these factories were using counterfeit uh, counterfeit fasteners, and they filed in November of 2010, they, they filed against Fossil uh, for trademark infringement. Interestingly, I think there was a little bit of uh, rumbling because uh, Romag filed suit, I guess, right before Black Friday, which of course is a very important day for, uh, for manufacturers and, and sellers like, uh, like Fossil. Uh, next page, please. So, so now kind of taking a look back through the procedural history for this case, um, at the district court level, there was actually a seven day bifurcated trial. So the jury actually determined liability uh, and they held for infringement. Um, but then the judge actually went to the jury and said, they wanted an advisory opinion on profits. Um, the jury held that there wasn't willfulness. Um, they did say that Fossil had acted callously um, but that there was no willfulness. And so the District of Connecticut held that there was not going to be an award of profits because there was no willfulness. Uh, it then went up to the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals. And um, the Federal Circuit said, you know, we are going to apply, we have to apply the Second Circuit Court law on profits, which is that willfulness is required for an award of profits. Um, interestingly, the, the states are, it's not an, an actual 50-50 split, but it's pretty close to 50-50 on the split of appellate courts that require willfulness and those that don't. Kind of an interesting observation is that um, even those states that don't require a showing of willfulness, they seem to only award profits with a showing of willfulness. So I think in years past, the practical results have really been about the same uh, in that willfulness has typically been required. Uh, so another, another quick thing on, on the federal circuit was that, you know, the federal circuit really seemed to want to award profits in this case. Um, they said several times they were constrained by second, second circuit law 
which required willfulness. Um, and then obviously it was uh, appealed up to the Supreme Court. Um, Romag's argument before the Supreme Court was basically that uh, Congress knows how to require willfulness, you know, when it wants to. Um, the statute is very specific about mens rea uh, that's required for an award of various types of damages. Um, you know, the statute for 1117A, when it talks about, you know, a, a award of profits, says, open quote, subject to principles of equity. Uh, so there is not a specific willfulness requirement. Um, Fossil also focused on statutory language. They, they were pointing to the principles of equity, uh, statutory language, saying that that in and of itself includes a willfulness requirement. Um, the Supreme Court uh, did not believe that and really went completely with Romag's side of things, saying that, you know, if, if we uh, thought there was supposed to be willfulness, would have specifically said it in the statute. And yes, uh, it is a highly important consideration, but it is not a prerequisite for such an award. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, turning now to the Tiffany uh, versus Costco case. This is a case that I think many of us have been watching for several years. <clears throat> These pictures on the on the first page here, just a little by way of background, uh, the ones on the left are actually from the case and they show uh, Costco's uh, display case uh, showing uh, two different Tiffany rings. And the picture on the right side is a picture from the USPTO. It's actually a one of the specimens that um, Tiffany has submitted, they of course have many, many registrations that include Tiffany's. This is just one of uh, many. Uh, real quick background on this. And, and you know, this case is up on appeal. Um, we thought we might actually, it's with the Second Circuit, we thought we might actually have an opinion by the time we did this webinar, but we have not seen it yet. Uh, but real quick background on this. In November of 2012, uh, a customer alerted Tiffany that they had observed rings in a Costco, this was in California, <clears throat> that she believed were being advertised as Tiffany rings. Uh, shortly after that, Tiffany got a hold of Costco and Costco, it, you know, they committed to Tiffany that they would remove all references to Tiffany from its display cases. They would send a letter to their customers that had bought these, quote, Tiffany rings uh, and would, you know, offered that they could return these rings for a uh, full refund. Uh, shortly after that, I believe it was February 2013, Tiffany then brought suit for trademark infringement and for counterfeiting. Uh, next slide, please. So by way of procedural history, uh, the case was brought to district court uh, for the Southern District of New York. Um, this was actually determined on summary judgment and the district, the district judge held in a fairly scathing opinion uh, that use of the Tiffany marks by Costco constituted trademark infringement and counterfeiting. Um, the district court then called for the jury to determine damages. Uh, the jury came back with, it was actually a two-phase damages trial. They came back with about 15 million in damages and then the judge added another 6 million on top of that for attorney's fees. Uh, the, also, just by way of background, when I read the case, you know, I've, I looked at this case originally and I thought, you know, I understood uh, that uh, Costco was arguing that the word Tiffany could be used in a generic sense. And arguably, I would say, well, you know, I, obviously Tiffany is a very powerful brand. Um, I thought that the, the generic argument might have a little bit of merit to it. And so I was interested to read the case. There were some facts that really weighed so heavily uh, in favor of Tiffany, uh, and I then started to understand why the district judge uh, issued the opinion, um, you know, that she did issue. Uh, a, a couple of those things I thought worth mentioning, very interesting, um, was that the display signs that we saw in that first, uh, the first slide, the way that Costco used the word Tiffany was actually the way uh, that they stated to other manufacturers for other types of goods. So they were using Tiffany in the same way as they did other manufacturers' names. So that was the first thing. Um, I thought more importantly and you know, more damning really was that um, there was an email in evidence uh, from a Costco employee 
in which she noted to others that she wanted the, the Costco's um, jewelry boxes or jewelry display boxes to be changed to have a more, and I open quote, I quote here, Tiffany and upscale look, close quote, to them. Uh, then the other thing was they actually, there had been actual confusion. Uh, there was emails from more than one uh, purchaser who had been confused, who alerted Costco to their confusion, and Costco did not do anything uh, to alleviate that confusion. I think that was also, so I think there was a lot of factual evidence be behind this that really weighed so heavily in Tiffany's favor. Um, you know, so uh, again, uh, Costco did argue the genericness. The court felt like uh, there was not enough evidence submitted to genericness, uh, and it is currently up uh, on the Second Circuit uh, for the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. Tim, if you had to predict, how would you, what do you think the decision is going to be on the Second Circuit? You know, um, having read and kind of seen some of the evidence that was submitted, I think that there will not be a change from the liability standpoint. Uh, I, I think there will still be a holding for infringement and for counterfeiting. I think there might be some change to the damage award. Uh, it actually could be more even, but I think that maybe some of, the, some of the calculations that were made on profits and whatnot might change a little bit. So I think we might see a change in the actual damage figure, uh, but I don't predict we're, we're going to see any kind of uh, difference in uh, liability. Next slide, please. So this is a decision they came down from the Federal Circuit uh, just recently, August 3rd, uh, and this uh, Royal Crown uh, versus Coca-Cola has been going on for about 10 years now. <laughs> uh, and so we've been, I don't know if you all have been watching it, I know many of us have been watching it for many of those uh, years. Um, in fact, it was kind of interesting, I did a case update, I believe it was four, four years ago, five years ago, and this case was one of the cases that I actually talked about at that time as well. So. I guess it's finally coming to a close. Next page, please. So by way of background, uh, Coke filed, I um, believe it was 16 uh, zero applications. Uh, and they were all opposed um, by Royal Crown. Uh, and they were opposed after Coke submitted a claim of acquired distinctiveness that was accepted. So no disclaimer was required. Uh, and they were opposed uh, the opposition was um, dismissed uh, after the TTAB held that Royal Crown uh, hadn't carried its burden of establishing zero was generic for a specific genus of goods, and that genus being uh, uh, soft drinks, energy drinks, and sports drinks. Uh, it went up to the Federal Circuit. Uh, the Federal Circuit uh, remanded, they vacated and remanded, and what they said was that the TTAB had erred in its genericness inquiry. This really at the federal circuit level centered completely, not completely, but mostly, I would say primarily, um, around the genus and, and the determination of what the genus was. Uh, they said that, um, the federal circuit said the TTAB had not considered whether the relevant public understood zero to refer to a specific or key aspect of the genus, and that being the subcategory of drinks with few or no calories. So the, the soft drinks, energy drinks, sports drinks was too broad um, as far as the Federal Circuit was concerned. And so they had uh, vacated and remanded. It went back to the TTAB. And the first thing the TTAB did was um, order the parties to brief certain issues. Uh, at that point, Coca-Cola, and I, I, you know, was a little bit surprised by this, but Coca-Cola went ahead, filed a motion, and amended all 16 of their applications to add the disclaimer of zero. Uh, the motion was accepted. Uh, the disclaimers were added, um, at which point it seemed that all issues uh, had been handled. However, Royal Crown opposed at that point, arguing that the entry of these disclaimers didn't resolve all the legal issues. In other words, Royal Crown wanted a determination that zero was generic or merely descriptive, and it had not received that through the entry of these disclaimers. Um, the appeal, you know, uh, the TTAB then appealed um, to the Federal Circuit. Next page, please. 
So the, the federal circuits, the issue was just, you know, had the TTAB erred in granting Koch's motion uh, to amend the applications to add the disclaimer of zero? You know, was that procedurally improper? Uh, and did the disclaimers render the appeal moot? And the, the federal circuit held, yes, that uh, the appeal was moot and the board had not abused its discretion in granting the motion. Um, so it appears that, uh, that this brings the, the 10 years of dispute on this issue to a close. We'll see. Um, but at least for now, it appears that it's been, been put to bed, so to speak. Next, next slide, please. So the next case that we're going to discuss is the Woodstock Ventures versus Woodstock Roots. This is actually a decision back from July of 2019, so about a year ago. But the reason I included it was that it's currently on appeal before the Second Circuit. So I think this is one to watch in 2020 for a decision. It was very recently fully briefed, you know, as of, I believe, last week or so. Um, so we should be getting a decision on this, you know, in the coming months. Next slide. So we have two parties here. We have Woodstock Ventures and we have Woodstock Roots. So Woodstock Ventures is the producer of the original famous music festival in 1969. They have various federal registrations for the Mark Woodstock for different goods and services, entertainment services, clothing, musical recordings, and other types of merchandise. They wanted to sell Woodstock branded marijuana, arguing that it fell within the natural zone of expansion of their marks because of the association between the music festival and marijuana use. So what they had done is they filed suit against Woodstock Roots claiming uh, trademark infringement. Woodstock Roots, on the other hand, the defendant owns registrations, federal registrations for the Mark Woodstock for various smokers articles. So it was items like e-cigarettes, cases, vaporizer pipes, lighters, rolling paper. And Woodstock Roots also had use of the Mark Woodstock for about 35 years or so in connection with a radio station. So the parties had coexisted for quite some time and they have a bit of a history. Uh, the court doesn't go into it, so I'm not gonna go into it too much, but there was a, a coexistence agreement between these parties at one time with Woodstock Ventures using the mark for entertainment services and promotional goods, Woodstock Roots for its broadcasting services and promotional goods. So what came before the court here, Woodstock Ventures sued Woodstock Roots for trademark infringement. Woodstock Roots counterclaimed that cannabis and cannabis related products actually fall within their natural zone of expansion of their federal trademark rights to Woodstock for their smoker articles. And it, in fact, it was Woodstock Ventures that was infringing on their marks. So Woodstock Roots, the defendant, moved for a preliminary injunction in the case seeking to enjoin Woodstock Ventures, the original music festival owners, from selling cannabis and cannabis related products under the Woodstock mark. Apparently they wanted to have um, Woodstock branded marijuana in honor of the 50th anniversary of the music festival. So they moved for a preliminary injunction, Woodstock Roots. And uh, next slide. The issue was whether Woodstock Roots was likely to succeed in proving a likelihood of confusion between the two parties' uses of Woodstock. So in essence, whether use of Woodstock on cannabis and cannabis-related products infringed on Woodstock Roots' rights in the trademark Woodstock based on its federal registrations for the various smokers' articles. Jessica, do you have any, you have a crystal ball on this one? Do <laughs> you have any idea where they're going to head with this? Yeah, so I mean, the court here, they went through the likelihood of confusion factors. Um, they did not address the issue of priority, which I thought was sort of interesting. They skipped ahead and found there was no likelihood of confusion, so they didn't need to address the priority issue. I mean, they went through all the factors, so they addressed the strength of the mark. They found Woodstock Roots, it was conceptually strong, but commercially weak. Uh, they didn't prove enough advertising or media coverage sales. They actually found the marks to be different, which I thought was sort of interesting. So on that point, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we were to see a different decision on it. So in terms of similarity of the marks, they said 
they rejected Woodstock's roots claims that the marks were identical. They focused on the difference in the fonts between the marks and uh, the fact that Woodstock Ventures used that guitar logo and Dove that was on um, one of the previous slides. What I think is interesting and what I think may change on appeal is this analysis of the zone of expansion and the proximity of the products to each other. Um, I, I, but I don't know how the court's going to roll, but I don't necessarily agree with their determination. So they looked at the proximity of the products. They looked at the channels of trade, where they advertise, where they compete for customers. And they found that that did not weigh in favor of granting the preliminary injunction. So Woodstock Ventures only sold in state licensed marijuana dispensaries, whereas Woodstock Roots, there was little evidence, but they claimed, you know, both parties are selling vape pens. This is you know, one item where they overlap in terms of trade channels. Mm -hmm. And the court really rejected that, saying the nature of the products, even though they may have overlapping trade channels, are different. You know, Woodstock Ventures is only selling recreational marijuana and cannabis-related products, whereas Woodstock Roots is selling just smokers articles. And what they distinguished it on were statements that Woodstock Roots made to the USPTO in order to get their mark registered. So the USPTO, it, Woodstock Roots in correspondence to the USPTO said that their products were not intended for use with recreational marijuana. As you may know, marijuana is not legal federally under the Controlled Substances Act. So you cannot obtain a federal trademark registration for marijuana products. So they could not obtain that registration. When they looked at the zone of expansion, Woodstock Roots, the defendant, claimed that cannabis-related products were within their natural zone of expansion from their federal registration that covered smokers' articles. But the court said they wouldn't give any in, in weight to that intent to expand because of the fact that recreational marijuana was illegal under federal law. So they're not going to expand that zone of protection of federally registered marks to cover cannabis products because it's illegal federally. And then they also, again, emphasize the fact that Woodstock Roots already said to the USPTO, you know, we're not planning on using these smokers articles for marijuana. So the issue I sort of have with that decision um, is that it's sort of an ironic result. You have Woodstock Roots who has these smokers articles and are obtained a lawful federal registration for them that they're seeking to stop Woodstock Ventures, who is selling marijuana that's illegal under the Federal Controlled Substances Act, but yet Woodstock Roots lost because of the fact that they can't get federal registration because of the Controlled Substances Act. So it's sort of an illogical result in my mind, and it really leaves trademark owners powerless under federal law to assert their trademark rights against cannabis related products because you can't get a federal registration for it. And what the court's saying here is, well, then you can't use that to expand the zone of protection to go after somebody who's using it for cannabis. So I don't think it's necessarily the right decision. So I'm, I'm interested to see what the second circuit decides and whether they, they acknowledge that sort of issue um, with trademark owners and their ability to protect against other parties from using their marks on cannabis. So we will see. Interesting. All right, next slide. So that was everything we had in terms of federal rulings. Um, we have some TTAB rulings um, this year and, and some from 2019 we wanted to discuss. Um, Ricardo Media, Inray Yarnell Ice Cream, and Inray MK Diamond Products. Next slide. So the first one I'm going to start with is this Ricardo Media versus Inventive software. This is actually a, a bit of an older decision. It was from August of last year. I, I included it. I thought it was sort of an interesting case. It deals with the application of the doctrine of foreign equivalents to personal names. So just for a little bit of background, the doctrine of foreign equivalents requires that words in a foreign language that are from a, a common foreign language be translated into English when an ordinary American purchaser would stop and translate the terms into the English equivalent. And essentially they would consider those marks that are translated to be equivalent. Next slide. Thanks. 
So here we have the applicant, Inventive Software, and they had applied to register the mark Richard Magazine um, with a disclaimer of magazine for their e-commerce website that was in the fields of fashion, beauty, and just a general lifestyle website. It was named after a Richard Wadtach, um, that may not be the correct pronunciation, but he was the owner and founder of this website at richardmagazine.com. And on the other side, we have the opposer, Ricardo Media. They own a federal registration for the mark Ricardo for magazines and books in the culinary field. Here, they're a culinary and lifestyle company that produce TV shows, publish magazines on food, recipes, uh, and various lifestyle topics. And this Ricardo uh, company was, it's based off a of a celebrity chef that's based out of Canada, Ricardo Larravee. So uh, Ricardo Media opposed the application for Richard Magazine on the basis of likelihood of confusion and the TTAB had to analyze it. Uh, next slide please. So they, the issue was whether the doctrine of foreign equivalence applies to personal names. And the TTAB held that the doctrine of foreign equivalence should not generally apply to first names unless there's evidence that consumers would stop and translate the names. And in this case in particular, there was no evidence that a consumer would stop and translate the names. So Richard Magazine was allowed to proceed um, onward towards registration. So it's sort of an interesting um, analysis. Uh, Again, they went through the, the similarity of the marks and similarity of the goods in the likelihood of confusion analysis. And, you know, first they start with similarity of the marks. And, and overall, they found that the differences significantly outweighed the similarities. They compared the fact that it was an English name versus a Spanish translation. They looked at one word versus two. Uh, they even said, you know, even though magazines disclaimed, it's not completely ignored. Uh, and then they went on to describe the differences in pronunciation and sound between the marks. Following that, you know, after they found the differences outweighed the similarities, they went on to discuss the doctrine of foreign equivalents. So it was assumed that Ricardo is the Spanish equivalent of Richard. They discussed the fact that Spanish is one of the most commonly spoken foreign languages in the U.S. and that's something that's commonly translated under the doctrine of equivalents. But the issue was, would an average American consumer actually stop and translate the names? And they found no. I mean, generally speaking, a name identifies a particular individual. You know, unlike other words that aren't personal names, other words have a common meaning. You know, whether it's in English or whether it's in a foreign word that's translated, they identified the same meaning. He said that doesn't really apply to names because you would assume that they are associated with different people, whether they're real or fictional people. And they also found that in terms of industry practice, it's not common for companies that use personal names to actually translate them when the mark is used in different um, in different consumers. You wouldn't translate that. It's really consistency is key when it comes to trademark usage. So you would use, you know, either Richard Magazine or Ricardo in that manner without translating it. So based on the fact that consumers view these marks as referring to particular individuals and that it's not really practice in the industries to translate these names, they found that there was no evidence that a consumer would actually stop and translate. So they said the doctrine of foreign equivalence should not apply to personal names because the consumer is going to see it and basically take the mark as it is and, and not translate it. Next slide. So this was up before the TTAB. Uh, In Ray Yarnell ice cream attempted to secure registration for the mark Scoop. So when they first filed for, uh, for Scoop, um, they identified the goods as just frozen confections and ice cream. You can see from the specimens that were submitted um, that the use of Scoop was not on the product itself. The, the photo on the right shows Scoop used on one of the spokespeople or mascot. Uh, and the one on the left is more of a cartoon. 
um, is kind of how it was described. Uh, there were also photos of the of an ice cream truck that had Scoot on the truck, but it wasn't really in a prominent fashion. I'm similar to the one on the left. It's hard to find, um, you know, the use of Scoop. Uh, but suffice to say <clears throat> that Scoop was actually not on the actual um, ice cream. Um, after uh, in rate, after Yarnell ice cream received the rejection to the specimens, they then amended their description. And the, they amended the description to include so they kept the frozen confections and ice cream, but then they added promoted and distributed by a mascot named Scoop at product promotions and distributions of the frozen confections and ice cream. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so really this came down to use of the mark, right? So uh, is, is Scoop entitled to registration for the frozen confections and ice cream when use of the mark was through a mascot and actu not actually on the goods themselves. Um, the, the TTAB, uh, and, and I, I did agree with this, uh, held that you know, use of the mark would, would really not be perceived as indicating the source of applicant's ice cream, but actually the mascot, you know, applicant's mascot. Um, and that, you know, evidence really did support the contention um, that, and, and, did, and really didn't fail to address that whether consumers would perceive scoop as identifying um, the goods themselves or um, the mascot. One of the things that I thought, one of the reasons why we wanted to include this uh, in the discussion today uh, was there was a quite a discussion before the, you know, that the TTAB really focused in on, on whether a human being could be a point of sale display. And that was one of the arguments that Yarnell made was that uh, the mascot was really a point of sale display. Uh, and so the, the TTAB, interestingly enough, said that they did not preclude or foreclose on the idea that you could have a human that acted as a point of sale display. They just didn't believe that in this case um, that the, the mascot um, did that. In fact, the, the language that they used, um, interestingly enough, was that you know, the, the point of sale display has to do more than just promote the goods. Uh, and that was you know, one of the things that Yarnell um, you know, argued uh, was that, you know, Scoop was, uh, was certainly promoting the goods. Um, the, the, um, the, the TTAB held that the specimen or the use of the goods must be calculated to actually consummate a sale and not just promote the goods. Uh, so, you know, it was very interesting case that the, the TTAB finally, you know, they did affirm their refusal to register, stating several reasons for that, failure to function, uh, the marks merely descriptive and because the specimens failed to show use of the mark in commerce um, with the identified goods. Uh, next slide, please. The next case that I'm going to discuss is InRay MK Diamond Products. This was, a, again, another TTAB decision. This one is a very recent decision um, on July 27th. So I wanted to include this. This one deals with uh, functionality of product design cases. Um, and it, it's a very lengthy decision. The decision itself is 62 pages. But I think it's great if, if you ever need a guide on functionality analysis and the, the factors that the TTA looks at, I think this is a good case to use um, for that analysis. So the applicant, MK Diamond Products, sought to register the product configuration that's shown here in this picture, which is the design of this saw blade, under 2F, and the goods were for circular saw blades for power-operated saws. So if you take a look at this picture, it's interesting that the portion that they're seeking to register here is only the curved slots or cutouts around the circumference of the blade that are shown in solid lines. So there's a number of other features in this picture that are shown in dotted lines. Those are not considered part of the mark that they're seeking to register. So the circular keyholes that are on the inner side of the slots, um, the V-shaped notch on the outside circumference of the blade, the three circular dots that are in between each cutout, none of that is included in what they were seeking to register in this case. They actually had a prior supplemental register registration 
very similar to this, but some of these other features were included um, within the design. So they claim this to be their tiger tooth design of the saw blades. The examiner refused registration of the mark on the grounds that it was functional and a non-distinctive product design that had not acquired distinctiveness under section 2F. All right, next slide, please. So the TTAB had to consider whether this product configuration for the circular saw blades was registrable. And they affirmed the refusal on the basis of functionality. And they also went on to discuss that they failed to meet their high burden of acquired distinctiveness. Now, the TTAB did not have to address the issue of acquired distinctiveness because any product design that's considered functional is not registrable, yet they go into the discussion, uh, they say, for the sake of completeness. So they found the mark was de jure functional. One thing I wanted to mention, and I thought it was sort of interesting, they, the TTAB went into a discussion of de facto functionality versus de jure functionality, and it's not language that examiners use anymore in their refusals, but I thought it was interesting. So de facto functionality means that the design of a product has a function. So for example, a water bottle's function is to hold fluid. That de facto functionality doesn't prevent registration. De jure functionality, on the other hand, does. So de jure functionality means that the product has a particular shape because it works better in that shape. And if the mark is de jure functional, it's unregisterable. So the TTAB you know, went through the, the Morton Norwich factors, which are the typical factors that are used to assess functionality. You know, they consider whether there's any utility patents on it, any advertising describing the utilitarian features, the availability of functionally equivalent designs by competitors, and whether the design results in something that's inexpensive to manufacture. So in several pages, they go through these really at length. I mean, they consider third party patents. And interestingly, MK Diamond Products argued, well, these third party patents, they're not our patents. They show different shapes of these cutouts. And it's not the same as our shape. So they shouldn't have any probative value. The TTAB rejected that and said, the fact that there are all these other patents out there that show slot designs as being a functional feature. The curved design in theirs falls within that scope of what is considered functional. And then they went through and discussed the advertising that was made by both third parties and the applicant's own advertising that emphasizes the benefits to the shape, cooling, stress relief, um, and, and other features. And considering all of these, they found this cutout design to be functional. And again, they went through a discussion after that about the acquired distinctiveness. They found that the applicant failed to meet the heavy burden because they would have had to be an exceptionally strong showing in this case because of the number of other parties out there that were using similar cutouts. So that just eliminated any claims that they had that they had a substantially exclusive use to enable them to assert acquired distinctiveness. So they rejected the, uh, the application for this product design. All right, next slide, please. So that's everything we had in terms of federal and TTAB decisions recently. We wanted to also discuss some recent USPTO practice changes as there's been a number of them. Next slide, please. The first one, um, deals with what's very timely in light of, of the world situation is that the USPTO now has a COVID-19 prioritized examination program for trademark applications. And to do so, to qualify for it, you need to file a trademark application that covers one of the qualifying goods or services. So you have to be seeking registration for either pharmaceutical products or medical devices that prevent, diagnose, treat, or cure COVID-19. 
and this is what I found to be interesting, are subject to approval by the US FDA. Or you have to be seeking registration for medical services or medical research services, again, for the prevention, diagnosis, treatment of or cure of COVID-19. So what happens in terms of just a little bit of procedure, you file an application for these covered goods and services, then you can file a petition to the director. This is not the petition to make special, it's a petition to the director, and the USPTO will waive the fee for this prioritized examination. You have to select a certain option, and then you need to provide an explanation that your goods fall within this description and qualify for prioritized examination. So what happens if approved, they will advance the initial examination of the application. So once it gets filed it'll and the petition is approved, it'll immediately get assigned to an examiner for examination. So it'll save you maybe two or three months in terms of the examination process. Next slide. So this, this change actually occurred back in August of 2019, uh, but we wanted to mention it again just because we continue to see um, there's a lot of questions about it, uh, a, a lot of phone calls from, you know, from foreign associates who uh, were not aware of it. Uh, and this is the requirement for a U.S. licensed attorney. Uh, one of the things that I think is interesting procedurally uh, is that uh, the applicant, uh, you know, the application can actually be filed um, by a foreign attorney, uh, but then they get of course, the office action saying it cannot proceed unless they have representation by a U.S. licensed attorney. So one of the things that we've seen, even though, again, this was implemented in August of 2019, over the last couple months, I've actually gotten, I've actually been contacted by several foreign associates um, who had filed, you know, had filed an application after August uh, and it had been submitted and then they got the first office action saying, no, you must, you know, reach out and have representation by a U.S. licensed attorney. Uh, it's, you know, a fairly easy to, um, to get the USPTO the information you need once you're, uh, you know, once you take on the representation. Um, but it has been interesting. Uh, you know, I think initially some of the foreign associates that handle quite a bit of work uh, in the States were aware of this. I, the calls I've been getting more lately um, have been from less, let's just, well, my last call was from uh, was from the country of Georgia. So I think I'm seeing now calls from foreign associates who do quite, don't do quite as much work um, in the United States. And again, that the, the goal is just to instill greater confidence that registrations are valid and comply with US laws. Um, you know, you all may be aware there, you know, over the last well, several years, there have been a number of questioned uh, applications, most of which were coming from China, but I'm, I think there may have been others as well. Uh, and there was a lot of questions around um, the actual applicants, uh, as well as the attorneys that were representing those applicants before the USPTO. Uh, next slide, please. And before I get to the next slide, I just wanted to, uh, we had got a question here dealing with the, the COVID um, prioritized. Somebody had asked, do you think there'll be, or is there a rush to trademark things that have COVID or coronavirus in the name? Um, I believe that there has been a, an increase in filings that relate to, to having COVID or coronavirus in the name. Now, again, I just wanted to note the prioritized examination program isn't necessarily going to um, apply necessarily to marks that have COVID or coronavirus in the name. It could be any trademark. It's just a matter of whether the goods and services covered within that application treat, diagnose, prevent, COVID. Um, so I just wanted to to make that distinction. But yeah, I think there's a lot of people that are trying to um, use that. But again, that's going to be in terms of trademark protection, something that's generic or, or descriptive and, and unprotectable in and of itself. Okay, so then moving on, we have um, the USPTO guidelines regarding specimens. The USPTO recently has seen a, a huge surge in fraudulent specimens being submitted in connection with applications and registrations. So, and largely coming from overseas and in particular from, from China. So the USPTO has had to implement certain 
requirements to increase ex examiner scrutiny in these specimens and request more information just to ensure the integrity of the trademark register. So they issued some examination guidelines last year that identified a number of factors for the examiners to consider when looking at these specimens. And then if there's issues in terms of whether they're actually real specimens, whether they're fraudulent or not, they can then request more information from the applicant just to ensure the accuracy of these. So we've been seeing, um, you know, even with legitimate uh, specimens, increased scrutiny in them. So one of the requirements that is if you're submitting any web pages, they have to have the URL and the date when the page was accessed um, on the specimen or in the description. They're also going to question if it's uh, the labeling on a product just appears very simple or very crudely applied, or if it looks like the mark has been superimposed on it. I mean, a lot of people are taking a photo and these fraudulent specimens and then just superimposing a trademark on it. And they'll use the same photo and just do a range of different trademarks on it and submit them in connection with different applications. So that's a, a big problem. One of the other things that we've had to do they're now potentially objecting to specimens if they're too clean or they look too nice. So if you have a professional photo of a product on a white background, you know, it's too easy to digitally manipulate those. So they are questioning those a little more. So we've actually been having clients take less professional photos and just take a regular photograph with other things in the background so they look to be more authentic. Next slide, please. Uh, one, yes, one of the other changes we've seen is this uh, proof of use audit program. Now, this particular program, while it's you know, certainly not directed only uh, to applications that are, say, based on priority um, from foreign applications, I think it probably is more relevant um, to those uh, types of applications. We've seen those, you know, the applications that have literally, you know, a thousand different goods or services. Um, but what this is, is that um, when an application or registration um, comes in, or application comes in, um, there is, it's subject to audit. It's not necessarily going to be audited, um, but if the application has at least one class with four or more goods or services, I keep saying applications, registration. So you're, for instance, you're, uh, you're going to file a declaration of use, right? And you've got a thousand different goods or services uh, and you can pick you know, one or two from there uh, to provide proof of use. Um, when you submit that, um, many times you will get a question back from the examiner saying, you must, you know, I picked three others that you have to prove use for. Um, and so anyhow, this first slide just shows which uh, types of registrations are actually open to on this audit program. Again, one class with four or more goods or services or two classes, each having two or more goods or services. Um, next slide, please. So in any case, you, you receive, we've actually received many of these. You get the office action um, and they want uh, at least two additional goods or services um, for each of the audited classes. Um, you're required to submit proof for each of those. And if the acceptable proof of use is submitted, then uh, USPTO sends acceptances. The, the issue comes in when you're asked for these additional goods or services and you either don't submit that proof or some or all of those goods are then deleted in response to that. Um, if that occurs, then you receive a second office action. And in that second office action, the SPTO requires proof for all of those remaining goods or services. Um, and again, in many of these applications that are coming from or registrations that were based on uh, a foreign application or a registration where you have you know, huge numbers of goods or services, it can be quite problematic. Um, we did see a proposal, I want to say a year or so ago, uh, that, that something that might occur is that if you uh, delete your charge for each good or service that you end up deleting, I haven't seen anything about that recently, but that was something that at least was being proposed, um, assuming to, you know, obviously increase scrutiny on, on, on registrations and applications in general, but also I think to, to cut down on um, some of the applications and registrations that come in to the PTO that have um, so many goods or services. Next slide. 
So I know we're, we're right about at our hour here, so I'll just go very quickly through this. This was our last point here. Uh, the USPTO has instituted certain filing requirements uh, for trademark applications. We now have to log in to USPTO.gov account. They're discussing future phases to verify account holder information, potentially more like the patent filing system. There's also mandatory electronic filing requirements that were implemented in February. And at the same time, the requirement that all applicants maintain a valid email address. So they're working on steps to mask that email address just so it's not out there for the public to view in, in all documents that are submitted. And then they're also recommending attorneys proactively monitor the debate for filings without their knowledge or consent um, because of some of these fraudulent applications that, that were being filed. Um, we're taking actually um, attorney information because of the requirement to have a US licensed attorney. Next slide. So I know we're at our hour here, and again, we're going to be recording this and can send it to everybody. We took a, we had one question going through, but if anybody had any additional questions, we we're happy to to stay on and answer those for you. And thank you very much to everyone for for attending today. We appreciate it very much.